Hello, everyone. Um, thank you ever so much. I can see a, a couple of more people join. Um, thank you so much for joining us this morning for our depositing large scale data with the UK Data Service. Um, I'm Christina. I am the Data Collections Development Manager at the UK Data Service. So I overlook the acquisitions of all the different types of data we make available via UK Data Service. We do take a very proactive approach. So, for example, if a critical number of users do get in touch for a specific survey, we will try our best to get in contact with the data owner to make available that study, of course, as long as uh, legally and ethically that is possible. But I also overlook the research data management training that we provide um, as part of the UK data service. And so it's uh, Monday morning. Um, and let's start with a quick icebreaker. So in your opinion, what's the best tech invention of the 21st century? We can see e-readers, indeed, um, we, we, we forgot about, uh, about books now. We do use quite a lot of e-readers. Streaming, yes, um, streaming comes in very handy. Um, mobile operating systems, yes, if we remember the, the Nokia 3310, I think it was, um, it has a calculator on it. It was working for from a mobile phone perspective, but now we can do our emails, um, we can do Excel, we can do even remote desktop um, in our own, um, own phones. So the next question is, and I need to, oh, E-readers, we got another smartphones. Yes, smartphones, indeed, they do come in very handy. But the second question, and I'm going to present this now, in a few words, why do you think archiving data is important? It can come from your own perspective, from your um, organization perspective. Why do you think archiving data, making data available um, is important? Data sharing, yes, we know now a lot of different funding bodies are actually mandating data sharing. Um, ESRC um, were the very first UKRI council in the UK to mandate data sharing. We are funded by the ESRC as well. So other people can make use of it, yes. Um, that's the that's one of the main aims. Um, the data lifecycle is so big and collecting all this data does come in handy for others. Reproducibility openness and transparency in research, increase data reuse, avoid duplication of research and manage publication bias, provides long-term value to data and enables researchers to further increase the value of this data. Lovely, lovely examples, lovely answers. And we are here at the UK Data Service to enable data sharing, to help you as data owners to make your data available um, in a nice uh, and understandable way for the secondary data users as well. So now I can go back to my presentation from the current slide. So as I was saying, the data itself has a much larger um, lifespan than the project that has created it. Um, and we can see this on a daily basis at UK Data Service. We host data from government organization, researchers, academia, and so many data users, secondary data users come and download the data from us. And they end up creating this amazing, beautiful project just using secondary data um, that they can access. It can be reused for a variety of uh, different purposes purposes, and we have seen lately there is a drive into especially linking current survey data with admin data, health data, etc. Now, when we're talking about who is benefiting from data sharing, as you said in the icebreaker, yes, the researchers clearly benefit from it, even from a reproducibility perspective, data citation perspective, but also the public, because transparency, we open up the data, the funding bodies as well, because they end up spending public money for public good. So by sharing that data, again, we are more transparent in, in what we do. But also the research participants themselves are actually benefiting a lot, especially if we're talking about data that has been collected from specific populations that are harder to reach. It's really great to actually provide that data. Um, and again, as long as it's ethically and share, um, legally possible. 
Now, when it comes to benefits to depositing with the UK Data Service, um, the first one, we get quite a lot of um, questions. How much does it cost to deposit with us? There are no costs whatsoever. Everyone that creates social science and population data is most welcome to deposit data with us. However, I do like to make a note here, while there are no costs directly associated with the data, there are costs associated with preparing the data for deposit and the documentation. And we're going to talk about that a bit later on. We do provide a fully online platform for creating, uploading and managing the deposits and today in the webinar, I'm going to present the platform for the curated um, uh, repository we host at the UK Data Service. We're going to see you can sign the license um, via the platform and we do provide very robust access policy with a three tier licensing framework, which again, I'm going to talk a bit more later on. Um, and just a note here, licensing can be quite um, difficult, um, especially if it's the very first time you're depositing. And again, we always welcome anyone getting in touch with us. If you have any queries on, or concerns about the data, you're not quite sure what access level would be most feasible. We can even help with assessing the disclosure risk in the data and seeing what would be the best access level you can share the data. We do provide data management guidance and support. We are here to ensure that all the data that is shared it's actually done in an ethical and legal way we do provide control access to sensitive and confidential data um, you might have heard about the five states framework which is our nationally used it was first developed by us um, at uk data service and the office for national statistics in 2017 um, but now more trusted research environments are adopting the five safe framework in order to provide access to de-identify data so again, the identified under UK GDPR is considered personal data compared to the anonymized one, um, which is not considered personal data anymore. We do provide resource discovery and we help data creators showcase um, their impact with the data that they've created, all the data sets that are all the data collections, it could be called data as well. Um, they do get a data side DOI which um, is a persistent identifier. So anyone using your collection for secondary use would have to cite that DOI, um, increasing the visibility of your data assets. We do promote all the deposits. We are part of the Consortium of Data Archives, the European Consortium of Data Archives, and we actually feed into their data catalog so everything that is promoted via our own UK data service catalog, we promote via the CESDA data catalog as well. We do have newsletters. Um, some of you might already be um, subscribed to it. And we do also have partner archives and research organizations that do promote our data assets. We can also provide the identify study level metrics um, for your data sets. Um, in data collections. So it's for those that are made available under safeguarded or controlled access. Now at the UK Data Service, we have a collections development policy in place and an appraisal process to ensure that all the new data offers are appraised accordingly. And our decision is based on what you will deposit. We can either accept the data into the curated repository, accept the data in the self-deposit repository we share, or advise you to use an institutional repository or alternative place of deposit. If, very rarely, um, if we advise you to use an institutional repository or another um, responsible repository, is because we think the user community of that specific repository would make much more use of the data than um, our user community at the UK Data Service would. For the curated repository, here we're talking about large scale data. And when I'm saying large scale data, yes, we're talking about thousands of people taking part in the survey or in the qual collection, but also sometimes you might have a population that is quite small. So it might be just three, 400 people, maybe that suffer of a specific condition that is very rare, that would still fit the curated repository. Now, how do you deposit in the curated repository? You do need to have an account and to bear in mind if these are institutional accounts, so um, individual accounts, not institutional accounts. 
Everyone that registered needs to sign our end user license agreement, which is on an individual basis. So while you might have other colleagues based at your institution that already deposited data or wish to deposit data in the future, you would have to create your own account. I'll do a bit of a demo as well, because with the online account, you can offer the data that you want to offer by completing a short offer form. The offer form contains minimal metadata for us in order to make um, a decision whether should we accept the data in the curated repository, is it better suited for this share, or is it better suited for another repository. To bear in mind is sometimes we might get in touch if there is not enough information or we have any queries about specific things in the offer form, um, we might get in touch before conducting the appraisal. You will be able to edit the metadata and submit the deposit form as well as sign the license electronically. We have gone full electronic, since September 2018, there is no paperwork to complete and everything can be done online. You will also be able to track the process of your data deposit from your account. And let's share now our quick demo. I can see Q&As are coming. Yes, please put any Q&As um, that you might have, any questions, and I will get to them at the end of the session. I hope everyone can see now the UK Data Service login web page. Again, you will have to have an account um, logged in with us in order to offer the data. Um, you might see here, the link is a bit different. I am doing all the testing on staging, but staging is exactly as the live version would be. So in order to deposit the data, we will first create an offer form. So we do an offer form here. Very important with the title, it needs to reflect what your collection is about. For example, survey of people on low income 2021. Ideally, at the end, we put the year as well. Um, we do tweak um, the titles, our curation team took the title in order to make it uh, more um, describing if that is needed. In the abstract, and here it's very important, please do provide information about the background um, of the survey or of the qual collection of the data collection that you have, um, you have gathered. Why did you gather the data? What were the main aims of the project? Did you accomplish the main aims? Um, what are the main topics in your collection? Um, what does exactly cover? Please do note if there is any funding. So for example, funding might come from ESRC or MRC. It's very important, especially for ESRC grant numbers to mention the grant number here um, because we at our end, we sign the grants off as compliant. But to bear in mind is, if you have a smaller data collection, uh, let's say a couple of interviews, um, your data might be better suited for our reshare repository. And we're going to, to guide you to deposit via reshare um, rather than the curated one. As I specified, we do have the five safe framework in place to provide access to data, which is considered personal under data protection legislation. If that is the case, we do ask data owners to mention here that the data is personal data. Um, it has not been anonymized. It has only been de-identified and to mention whether the person depositing the data is the data controller or authorized on behalf of the data controller. Let's say our, our survey is not controlled access. Under contacts, um, and I can't stress this enough, it's very, very important to know who is the data creator because most of the cases, the data depositor is not the data creator. It's just an individual that can create all the offer form and deposit form and send, send us the data, but it's not actually the data creator. The data creator can be an individual or an organization, it depends how the project has been set up. Especially for the large scale um, surveys and data collections, it's usually more an organization rather than an individual, but it can happen 
but please do um, note all the data creators in the contact information. The data collector as well. So for example, if you've hired um, any research agency that conducts collection of data, please do mention who the data collector is. Are there any contributors? Um, and if you have any partner projects, any projects um, in the project, any partners that have helped, you can name them um, as contributors for um, acknowledgement purposes. Now, the geographical coverage, we gather information in the offer form about the countries. Um, we do get quite a lot of data that covers multiple countries. Um, we do get quite a lot of data that covers only um, the United Kingdom. We will see here, this is something we call a uh, controlled vocabulary. If we start typing, I will start typing another country because that gives Colchester as this is where I am based. Columbia, for example, and we select it. You can add as many as you need. Um, you can remove them. Um, the same applies for regions. And if you include towns and villages as well, please note when we're talking about towns and villages to bear in mind, is our data de-identified rather than anonymized? Is there any other geography covered in your data collection? And the following one, the population information, again, this is very important when it comes to the appraisal process that our collections development team does, because we need to have information about the population your sample has been drawn from. Um, it can be, for example, all 16 to 64 aged individual based in private households in the UK. Um, if you want to mention exactly the achieved sample as well, that's better, but at least the very basic information about the population of your data collection is needed. Now we're getting into consent and confidentiality, two very important forms to, um, fields to bear in mind. Has consent is been given for the sharing of the data to take place? And is the data anonymized? Under anonymization, we do ask all the data owners to specify if they have any concerns, um, especially with the UK GDPR, we have the special category data. Is special category data included? What is the level of anonymization? Have you done, have you done top and bottom coding, banding, et cetera? So as much information as you can include in, the, in this section, the better. If you want to include some references and publications, so a lot of data owners might have already published their technical report um, or even a user guide, you can provide um, the URL or the DOI of that specific resource here. And at the appraisal stage, we actually verify the, the information there um, if information in the offer form is not sufficient. Again, we might have to come back um, if we have any additional questions. Under file description, um, ideally for the description of the data files, it would be great to specify, for example, two data files of 1,500 variables each, or 50 transcripts of approximate 20 to 30 pages each, the more details, the better. Now, the documentation files as well are very important. And in the presentation today, I am going a bit on what documentation we are expecting when uh, we receive data from data owners. So please include, for example, if we're talking about one data, you might say, well, I will be able to upload the questionnaire, a data dictionary. I have a tech report as well. If we're talking about qual, oh, I have the topic guides um, that could um, be of help to secondary data users. Now, once we have completed this, we're happy with it. Do take a look over it. again. Um, you might need help from different colleagues as well to complete the form. So it might be best to complete it in a Word document and then put it online. That is, that is totally fine. Um, but once we're happy with it, we can save the form at any given time. Just save the form, go talk with a colleague, come back and edit it. Once we're happy, we can submit the form. And we'll see now, under here, we have under deposit or appraisal survey of people of low income 2021. So it's with our team 
for review and we will be in touch in due course. We will also see that we get quite a lot of um, automated emails and instead of showing one that I've got from the testing, I will show one here. I'm just making the text a bit, um, a bit bigger. Um, you will receive, the moment you press submit, you will receive an automated email letting you know that we've received your offer um, and we aim to conduct all appraisals within the five working days. Um, if there are any um, queries or concerns with the offer form, please do get in touch. Um, you can get in touch directly by replying to this email. It comes to the shared mailbox. So please do feel free to get um, in touch by replying to collections at UK Data Service. Now we'll go back to the presentation. As I said, it's a lot of back and forth, but just to demonstrate everything, um, as clearly as possible. So we've seen the offer form, we've seen how we completed. Please do make sure to offer as much information as possible, but bearing in mind, this is the minimal metadata that we need to make um, uh, the appraisal process happen. Now, what is this appraisal process I keep talking about? Um, we do have a data appraisal group that consists of people from the collections development team, from the curation team, from the user support team with different expertise. And when we do need to refer different offers, a lot um, of different um, people do come um, to help with that specific appraisal of the data. What do we look when we get an offer form? We look, what is the strategic value of that specific data collection? Is there potentially secondary use and analysis for research? Can the data be used for teaching and learning purposes? Would it help with replication and validation of existing research? And to bear in mind the validation and replication of existing research, sometimes we do need that the identified data to be able to provide the replication. Is it relevant to the UK data strategy, UK data service strategy forum. So what type of data is there um, deposited? Do we have longitudinal data addressing different challenges such as linked data, data about organization, cross-sectional data? We look at whether the data owner has a mandate to share with the UK data service. And as mentioned with the ESRC funded um, data sets, the data must be deposited in a responsible uh, repository, which can be UK data service, the curated or the reshare, depending on the type of data, but it can also be deposited in an institutional repository. But in order for us to sign off that grant market as compliant, we would need a metadata record done available via the reshare platform. We do have a separate webinar about reshare, um, and I welcome all of you to attend that. It's recorded as well, so you can see it um, at your own pace. You don't need to attend a new one. Uh, but any questions about reshare can be um, addressed to our reshare team. We do look, is the data useful for supporting decision making and policy formation? So again, the curation um, repository at the UK Data Service is about population representative data, large scale data. Is it used for, for international and longitudinal research? Um, is the microdata otherwise not available to the research community? Either it's more disclosive and it could have been made available via another repository, or we do look if that specific data set has been published with another responsible repository. Um, we are very keen on not duplicating persistent identifiers. So we wouldn't want to create another persistent identifier when there's already one available. Of course, is the data unique? Is it already related? to what we have in the collection. And you might have seen in our catalog, we have a lot of key series, um, annual population survey, the labor force survey, crime survey for England and Wales, etc. And every year a new survey appears. So that's when uh, that might be ticked. We do make sure that the data can be made available, as I've said, legally and ethically, um, and they do not prohibit reuse. Um, there are a number of, um, I wouldn't say very common cases, but it happens when the participant information sheet or the consent form have precluded data sharing. So we're always in touch with the data owners to discuss those aspects. 
have enough information about the documentation being provided. So do we know we're going to get a PDF user guide and a questionnaire or topics guide, et cetera? Can we convert them very easily? And we're going to talk about what our curation team does when it comes to converting data. Does the data exceed five gigs? Um, and you might wonder, it's 2021, why is five gigs so important? Um, it's actually downloading via the web browser. So for example, if you safeguard the data, if we download um, via Chrome, sometimes if it's more than five gigs, it becomes unstable. So we try to take all the different um, approaches there, maybe bundling the, the different types of data. You might have a collection with quant and qual and having the quant separate from the qual so that researchers can download it quite easily from their web browser. Is the third party reliable and uh, is it likely for them to change the data throughout time? That's not a problem. And at the very end um, of the webinar today, I'm going to cover new editions. So you've already published a survey. What happens if there are changes to it? Um, and it is very straightforward. Now, once we have accepted your offer in the curated repository, you will get a nice email informing you that we have completed our appraisal. We are very happy to let you know that the data has been accepted into the curated repository. And we kindly ask the data owners to review the license agreement and get in touch with us at collections in regards to the access conditions of that specific um, data collection. To bear in mind is we can't accept any data for data files um, before having the license agreement in, in place. The license agreement is the one that enables us to look at the data, process the data, make the data available. Now, because we're talking about the license in the access framework, just a quick overview. Um, we are very keen on ensuring that proper access safeguards are put depending on what is in the data. So we provide the options of open, safeguarded and controlled data. When we're talking about open data, there's no real disclosure risk in that data. Most of the time we're talking about aggregate data and we provide all the Creative Commons licenses, why it says almost no restrictions on reuse. We do provide, for example, Creative Commons non-derivative as well. If that, if it would be a problem, if derivatives would be um, created. However, when it comes to open, we do encourage data owner to think of a, a very less restrictive license, such as Creative Commons um, attribution. Depending, it might be non-commercial purposes if the funded project required the data not to be used for commercial purposes. Now, the safeguarded data is available to all our registered users. So again, users that have to sign our end user license agreement, clearly stating they will maintain the confidentiality. If they find any problems, they will be in touch with us as soon as possible. And here we're talking about data that has this zero to low disclosure is. So we're talking about data that makes available the occupation of the individual, their age, their location, as in their government office region. And while putting all these elements together, there might be a residual disclosure risk in there. So we're taking the safeguarded approach in order to protect our participants. The safeguarded option also provides the uh, option for any data owners to apply additional conditions to their specific uh, data collection. And we've seen in the email, it did say, if you have any additional conditions, please do get in touch with us um, and mention it when you, you mention about the access levels. These additional conditions could range from, for example, you might want to be informed 10 days before a publication that a secondary user, user is conducting, or um, it might even be depositor permission. For specific studies where there might be a bit more sensitivity, um, we do have the depositor permission only option, which the data owner has to complete 
the depository permission form. It's a very short form, a couple of pages, where they actually specify why they want to use the data. And then they, um, the form is sent to the data owner. We can't approve it unless we give the data owner approval. And only once approved, the data owner will, uh, the data user will be able to download the data via the same interface. We just tick a box in our backend and they can download the data. Now, when we're talking about control data, this is where the real disclosure risk lies. We're talking about data that has been de-identified, so we have a lot of granular information. We might have full-digit postcodes, for example, um, socioeconomic classification for digits, so very detailed as well. Um, and by putting all that information together, the risk of identifying someone is quite high. Because the risk of re-identification is quite high, we make this data available in our secure lab, the UK Data Service Secure Lab. It's a uh, secure research environment, which is accessed only by approved researchers. So they will need to complete uh, an approved researcher application. They will need to complete a project approval, which needs to be approved by the data owner. They will need to provide us information about their tech setup. We only allow certain um, IP addresses. They would basically need their IP address to be listed, uh, white listed for them to gain access. They do need to have training and pass actually the training to be able to access the data. And even their outputs are actually checked for secondary disclosure. The threshold of the UK data service is 10. So nothing below 10 can be taken out of the secure lab environment. However, um, if a data owner considers maybe eight is feasible, again, that is a discussion with the collections development team saying we think thresholds of eight are acceptable for our data, um, and we can then set up a meeting to discuss this further. The deposit form. Okay, so we have been invited to submit the deposit form and get in touch with the collections development team. I will have to share again the screens. And... I cannot access the staging on my own personal machine. So that's why I keep going back um, into my uh, remote desktop for work. Um, what I have done yesterday, I have created a test offer form, which is at the edit and submit the deposit form. Please bear in mind while you are doing this, we are under the assumption you have already contacted the collections development team with information about the license. We're going to show the license in just a minute. We make the license available for you for signature. Once you submit this form, if the license is not in place, please do not send the data because we are unable to pick it up until the license is signed. If the license is signed, everything can be sent to us. The difference between the offer and the deposit form is the deposit form contains all the information that will be available to data users in the data catalog. So it's a lot more information um, than in the offer form. Um, we separated the main topics in here because you might want to provide further information sometimes even further information about specific variables, which might have not been included in a specific um, access category. Um, everything that you've entered before will be copied to this, so you don't need to um, edit that information unless, for example, you wish to do so because you might have forgotten to add something. That's totally fine. You can edit it, but everything has moved across. We will see under coverage, we now have to specify the spatial unit. Um, do you have something like government, office region in the subject category? What does your data cover? Exactly. Again, this is what I've said we call a controlled vocabulary and it offers different options. Um, you can tick as many applicable as they are. We usually advise not to tweak, uh, to tick more than six. What are the dates of the field work and what is the time period that the collection covers? Sometimes they're different. If they are the same, please do just complete the field work and we understand that the time um, period is the same as the fieldwork um, time period, so that's not a problem. 
We do have an additional um, section here about methodology, where we clearly ask what is the number of variables. This is very important for a consistency perspective. So for example, if you mention there are 300 variables and we get a file with 1,300 variables, we will come back asking, have you sent the files which we shouldn't have got? Um, or is there something wrong in the, um, in the deposit form? And we can change this information for you. That is not a problem. How many um, number of units? So we're here talking about the achieved sample that you have. So while the population was, was all 16 to 64, your number of units were, I don't know, 25 thousand individuals, for example. What was the observation unit? So we've seen we can have data about organization, about people, about families. Again, a controlled vocabulary. For example, we have individual. Where was the individual in our case located? Is this a national? We're talking about um, UK, subnational. Maybe we are talking about a survey only done in Essex, um, or is it other? And you can provide information about what other means. And of course, we have cross-national for the data that covers different countries as well. What were the methods of data collection? Again, we're talking about a controlled vocabulary. vocabulary. You just need to select how the data was collected. You can select as many as necessary. There are quite a lot of different data collections that have different types of method of data collection. So you might have a questionnaire, but you might have clinical measures in it as well. What was the sampling procedure? Was it multi-stage stratified? Is it the total universe? If it is other, you can specify other and in here, other sampling procedure and then details about how you've actually um, done the sampling for the collection. Is there a weighting um, variable or variables in your data collection? Again, a curated repository, it's all about large scale population representative data. Most of the time, yes, the weighting was used and the documentation covers how the weighting has been created, how people can apply it, etc. Um, if you have the total universe, it might not be applicable, or there might, might, there might be no weighting variable in the data. Um, and you can get in touch with us saying, we might want to add the weighting variable at the later stage as well. It does happen. Um, or you might want to simply update um, the weighting variable as time passes by. Again, you can complete more references and publications if you want. If you have already completed something, you would have information here. So you just need to add um, other extras that you might have. We will see under the file description, we have a couple of more uh, boxes that appeared. If you have provided enough information about the data files and the documentation files, don't need to worry about that. However, if, for example, you have done digitization, uh, less, I would say, um, common now to happen, but if you have done transcription, um, we do ask data owners to provide information about how they transcribe the data, was it done in-house, was it done by another um, institution. Um, there are quite a lot of data owners that hire professional transcribers to do. And just a couple of information. Um, if you have a transcription plan that you have used, please always deposit that as um, documentation. It always comes of handy. Now, you might have also used actually different data sources to create your own data. To bear in mind here, and please mention as many as um, you have used, and if you have any queries, I can't stress enough, do get in touch with us, because while data might be available via different websites, that doesn't mean you can create different things without the permission from the original data owner. So we always check when it comes to data, is permission in place? If we're talking about derived data from an existing uh, collection, um, if the original data has been published under, let's say, Creative Commons by um, just the attribution, the very standard, very low um, Creative Commons license, that is not a problem. But most of the times we see data created from collections that are published under stricter um, access conditions. 
And of course, we do ask for the source location and the access level for, for all of them. However, best to get in touch as soon as possible if you are creating data from other sources, just to double check, can the data be shared? Um, or do I need permission from the original data owner before being able to share the data? Once we have completed everything, we can submit the form. It comes to us um, in the collections development team you will get an automated email thanking you for submitting the form, informing you that if you have signed the license, please submit the materials. Now, when it comes to licenses, again, if everything is done via your account, you can find the licenses under the licenses tab, just in here. And we can see the one for my test offer form. We can see I've received the, I think you can see that I've received the automated email that the deposit form has been submitted successfully. When it comes to the license, um, please do read the license. We're not going to go through all the different clauses here. Um, it's a, a short license. We've tried to make it as human readable as possible, but if there are any queries on, or concerns, again, please do get in touch. What's most important, under further condition, we clearly specify in human readable language how we'll make the data available as you have instructed us to do. For example, the data collection is available to users registered with the UK Data Service and commercial use of the data requires approval from the data owner. This is our standard safeguarded access. Most of our collections are available under this standard safeguarded access level. So it will reflect exactly what you've told us in the email to collection. Again, we can easily sign the license via our account. And to bear in mind, as the data depositor, you might not have the copyright in the data, but you might be authorized to sign the license. This happens, I would say, probably 80% um, in the deposit cases um, is that the data depositor has been authorized on behalf of the data owner to sign the license and to deposit the data with the UK data service. So in this case, we would pick not the owner of the copyright, but I am authorized to, um, to grant the license. If you are the owner of the copyright, that's fine. Again, not a problem, but please make sure um, you read the declaration, tick the uh, box that applies. Um, if you have any queries, for example, you're unsure, can I sign the license? Again, do get in touch. It's usually a discussion that you and your institution need to have. Can I sign this license? You can also download the license as a PDF and pass it by your colleagues to double check if everything is fine and they're happy for the license to be signed by you. If the license needs to be signed by one of your colleagues, that is not a problem. They will need to have an active account with us, but as long as they have the active account with us, we just assign the license to them and then they can sign the license just by clicking here, sign license. The license has been signed. Now we can go back to our presentation from the current slide. We've signed the license. We've seen the license declaration. I can already hear the email, the automated email I received saying, thank you for signing the license. You can now submit the materials. I've included a couple of slides and I hope this will come in handy at your own pace. Throughout the data life cycle, it's best to check how am I going to make the data available? What documentation am I making available? And throughout the project to make sure that you're making this possible because otherwise before the deposit, you will need quite a lot of time to prepare everything. So we start by using consistent and meaningful file names. If we have quant data, we have self-explanatory variable names, which are actually nicely labeled. It doesn't necessarily need to be SPSS or Stata that come with embedded metadata. It can even be a separate CSV file that describes the variables, but we need these descriptions um, very nicely available. Do make sure that there's consistency across the file. Remove any temporary variables. Um, remove any repetitions of variables. Sometimes it happens. You just copy a variable to create your own derived, just making sure that the file that you're depositing is the final version. Providing an anonymized primary sampling unit information is available. 
making sure the level of anonymization is appropriate and getting in touch with us if you have any queries about that. Um, we can always, always help. Include weights, if available, make sure the weights are documented in the documentation. Use our recommended transcription format for all the qual files. Um, if you yourself in-house are converting the data from, let's say, state to SPSS or CSV, et cetera, do make sure that um, there's no data loss there. It rarely happens, but it can happen. Um, ideally, you can just deposit one format, be it SPSS, data, CSV, whatever you, whatever you have and whatever you use in-house, and then we do the creation of the different different formats. Again, if you use data sources, make sure that copyright permission is in place where applicable. If we have any queries regarding that, we do get in touch with, uh, with you and we might require a short meeting to discuss. Finally, do try to make sure that the data you're depositing, it's in a final version. If it's not in a final version, that's not a problem. Um, it happens every now and then. We think it's a final version, but oh, we forgot to include this. Um, we can create um, a new edition or ask our curation team to stop with the processing un until you send us the revised files. Documentation. So when we're talking about quant data, already discussed a bit in the offer form, we are expecting things like the technical report, um, information leaflet and consent forms, if any, questionnaires with the universe and routing instructions, if you use show cards, please send us the show cards, coding frames and coding instructions in your specific data files. When we're talking about qual data, Please do submit the participant information sheet and blank copies of the consent forms used. We just want to ensure that it is okay to share that data. Topic guides, this come extremely handy if the data is made available under safeguarded access. Data, the documentation, the data comes with will always be available as open. So others can see, oh, this collection is about X, Y, Z. It will actually come of help. So I'm going to deposit the collection. Also, a data list, and we do provide a template, um, which is more of a readme file um, for a qual collection serving as a finding aid. Submitting materials is very straightforward via the University of Essex Venture Service. If your organization has a preferred method, again, please do get in touch. That is not a problem. We can create accounts um, for your own specific platform um, and do make sure that all the data sent to us is password protected. And if you're sending confidential data, that you actually mark that as confidential. We do use restricted internally. We put an underscore restricted. That's the, that's the suffix. But if you use any other um, type, for example, underscore confidential, that's totally fine. Uh, just let us know that you are sending uh, confidential data, which needs to be encrypted as well, besides password protected. We do review all the materials that we get from a confidentiality and data integrity perspective. Again, if any queries arise, we will be in touch. To bear in mind is while we might have some proposed changes, Sometimes most of them, these are about anonymization. We might think the disclosure risk is a bit high. What we actually do is we make a plan. For example, we think age should be banded and postcode shouldn't be included. We can include government office region. Oh, income needs to be top and bottom coded. All of this is documented and sent to you as the data depositor. Would you agree with the changes from our perspective? The disclosure risk is too high. Are you happy for these changes to take place? And only once we have your approval, we will then apply the changes. The curation process. You send everything. Okay, so what do you do with my data and documentation files? We do carry out enhancements. So if the labels in the files, for example, are not um, complete, we would complete the labels in the in the quant files. For qual data, we might add headers um, as standard for our collection. We do generate multiple data formats for dissemination and also for preservation purposes. So researchers can download the data in SPSS, Stata, or tab delimited ASCII format, but we also have preservation formats for quant data, um, which make sure that if 
IBM decide not to release SPSS anymore, um, we can actually reconstruct the data and use a different software. The same applies for, for qual data. We save it as RTF rather than .x or .x uh, for Word documents. We collate and prepare user documentation. So the documentation that you send, we nicely put headers on it. We make it more user friendly um, to say. We do create the DDI compliant catalog metadata, which is available to you, all the users. So sometimes we might tweak a little bit the abstract to make it more concise, um, but everything is so that the secondary data user um, gets uh, information that is very easy to read. We do assign, as mentioned, digital object identifier data set, data site DOIs. Um, and within 30 working days of receiving a data set, we publish it via our data catalog. For qual collection, it might take 35 days. Now, as I said, I'm sorry, I keep checking the clock. Uh, but I can see we only have two questions, so that should be fine. Um, if your study has already been published and you wish to publish a new edition, i.e. Uh, you have updated weights, um, weighting variables in the data, you have made some changes, you want to add a new wave of data, for example, do get in touch with our collections development team. We can start the process for you and you don't need to complete the offer form again because this is an existing study. You would only need to complete the deposit form um, and mentioning any changes to the data in the abstract information, i.e. a new edition, December 2021, with updated weighting variables has been um, uploaded. As mentioned, I have included further resources um, and please do make use of them uh, once we make the slides available. More than welcome, do get in touch with us with any questions you might have. Um, I will include before making the slides available because I kept mentioning research as well for um, acad more academic uh, based days. I will include the research uh, mailbox as well for any specific questions about depositing in the research um, depositor repository. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I know. Uh, have tried to cover as much as possible in just an hour. Um, I'm glad to see um, people are saying that the session has been informative. Please don't hesitate to contact us with any, any questions. We are here to help. Um, that's the very bottom line. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'll speak with at least some of you soon. <laughs>